decelerate behavior, people. That's exactly right. Woo. There is our new music, and I hope you all like it. We may have some other changes until we're going to mess around and do a little experimenting with this podcast. And you know, right now, Doug and I, we feel like rocking. And, uh, you know, that's what we uh, where we started from. Nice little baseline to get things going. Yeah, that was actually Doug playing in his basement. He has a, <laughs> uh, a secret talent that he doesn't share with a lot of people, but it helps us with our podcasting. I, I wish that I could even share it with myself. Well, how are you doing, Doug? I'm not doing that bad. How are you doing? I am doing really well. It's always nice to talk with our podcast guests and always nice talking with you. Same coming back at you. We have some pretty good topics today, so let's not waste any time and get right into our announcements. The first announcement is that, and I guess I already mentioned it, we are going to, we're doing some refinements to the podcast. So we have some new music there to start it out. We also, I think finally, Doug and I have gotten the technical issues down where we have the quality of our voice will be good. And probably the only other hurdle I think we have left, Doug, is that when we do our interviews to start getting you involved with the interviews too because before we couldn't figure that out but now right. we know how to do it so our next interview we'll start having both you and I interviewing our guests well I look forward to it the other announcement is that ABA just went down in Phoenix which you had a chance to attend unfortunately I did not and uh, general thoughts about the conference? Well, it is definitely big. Uh, this is the first year that everything kind of wasn't localized at one hotel. And oh, instead... really? There were two hotels? No, it was held in a convention center oh. that, f that fed from three or more hotels. So... While there was now everything in one place with regards to the conference, the people were spread out. So it was sometimes difficult finding, instead of running into everyone in the hotel, you had to hope to kind of run into them at the conference center. So it's just, you know, it's the nature of the beast. We're getting larger or mm -hmm. applied behavior analysis is getting larger. So or Association for Behavior Analysis, getting larger. And so we've just kind of grown up that we don't fit in hotels anymore. So mm. it'll take something to get used to. I, I There were part of me that, that liked being able to kind of be localized at one place, but it's the nature of the beast. Mm. And for some of our podcast listeners who might not know this, a number of precision teachers happen to come from the behavior analytic tradition and one of the one of the events that always occurs at the annual conference of ABA is there's a chart share and that chart share keeps getting bigger every year and there are also a number of threads uh, uh, that discuss precision teaching research there are poster presentations and of course there are business meetings and other precision teaching happenings that occur every year at ABA the uh, let's see I just had a thought but I forgot what I was gonna say oh I remember uh, also for those of you who would like some more information there is a precision teaching wiki which is fabulous I can't I can never stop plugging that because it's such a wonderful wonderful website and soon there will be some information from the conference that's there for so those of you that like to check it out please do so and those are the announcements that i have anything else that uh, from you doug no no announcements uh it's 
still summer, so it's getting hotter and more humid, although I do have to say it was a different heat in Phoenix. And uh, coming back home, I, I like my humidity, so it was dry out there. Yeah, that's what they say, a dry heat. Mm-hmm. Dry heat's overrated, if you ask me. That's right. Give me my humidity any day. Mm-hmm. 90 degrees, but with the humidity, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I like to feel like I'm swimming as I walk. Yeah, yeah. That's that's Pennsylvania weather. That's right. Well, I have some other... Let's move on to email question. We have our first email question, Doug. Uh, we should have theme music for the email question. I agree. We do need to have some cool theme music. Maybe that's so you, one of the refinements that we'll do. We'll have some type of cool music that is the transition from each section. That, that You took the words right out of my mouth. I'll have to think of something. Yeah, think of something. Well, let's get... Uh, here's the question. It's from Karen. And Karen writes, Dear Dr. K... I had you as a professor for my ABA certificate at Penn State and really enjoyed my experience. I especially, I especially liked your lecture on standard acceleration charting. You know, that emphasis, I put that in there. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, if PT and the chart are so powerful, why isn't everyone using it? The old, if it's great, why isn't everyone using it? What do you think about that, Doug? Well... Let's see. I would say first off, if I was unknowing about anything precision teaching or anything with the chart, mm -hmm. if I picked up the standard acceleration chart, my first inclination is that it would terrify me. Yeah. Now, we do know that it doesn't take that long to learn it and that children, adults can use it readily, but you, that first step, if you're receiving so many different things as a teacher, so many different things have to make so many different graphs, and you look at that chart, it's unlike anything you've ever seen, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, you make a, a couple good points. This question, honestly, has been something that has dogged me for years. I can, I, I got into precision teaching when I was a undergraduate student at Youngstown State. That was the mid 80s. And you, know, you really don't know a lot when you're an undergrad, but as I became a master's student, you know, I was teaching and I was using these charts and you know, nobody knew what the heck that it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you try to talk to people and, yeah, they may be interested, they may not be. Then I became a doctoral student, and I remember even attending you know, other people talk about this issue. And you, know, you, you listen to other perspectives, and you talk to more people. And then uh, be, after that experience, I've done a lot of teacher training where I've worked with school districts. I've worked with many, many people who just don't know about precision teaching. And, oh, even before... Uh, I guess I should to, should share this story. In one of my interviews, and I, I remember this. You don't remember a lot from when you're interviewing for Jaws, but I remember this. I was interviewing at a university, and I was doing my presentation, and some guy, well, some guy, he was a professor. He was asking me lots of questions through my presentation, but it was very cordial. When I got into his office, the very first thing that he said to me was, hey, if this stuff is so good, why isn't everyone using it? I thought, oh, what a, what a question to ask, a, to ask me because he really, it wasn't a question that was, I want to share information. It was a question, I'm challenging you. I don't like precision teaching. Why the heck isn't everyone using it if it's so good? It was that kind of question. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've always thought about this, but you bring up a lot of good points. And... Anytime you have a system, regardless of whether it's precision teaching or whatever, where you have, where there's technology that's involved with it, there is a cost in terms of learning that technology. Right. So you said the chart, okay? You look at the chart and you say, well, why do I have to learn this? Why can't I use my normal charts? 
And there are so many reasons why that's true. And I've been working on a paper for a while that I've been trying to build you know, more so than just, I mean, we have some of that out there, but I'm trying to make this really technical. But there are so many reasons why the standard acceleration chart is the best chart that's out there for time series data. And I'll say that right now, and I'll be unapologetic about it. That is the best chart out there. And, well, I don't want to go off too much on that, but let's just leave it as uh, uh, leave it with that. So uh, there's that issue with the charting. And then we do have a measurement system, and we have these other procedures. And when you do these things with precision teaching, you know, we're looking at collecting data daily. That's a lot of work for a teacher, right? Or a lot mm -hmm. of work for anybody. So you're going in saying, okay, here's the system. you got to learn it. it. There's this response cost, so to speak, and that you have to do more work. You have to make decisions. You have to make changes. I think if you look at it just from that perspective, from a human behavior perspective, there, what are the, uh, the contingencies or what are the events that are going to compel a person to take that on? And that is a complicated question, but I think by and large, if you look at, let's just take our educational system in the United States. If I'm a teacher, why would I take on, why would I learn all this information, do all this extra work for my class when, you know, no one's telling me to do it. I, I could just do whatever, you know, I'll just do the thing that I want. I'll read the kids a book, I'll pull out the sock puppets and I'll entertain kids and everyone's going to be happy, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're, uh, and again, I'm probably, I don't want to, I'm not attacking <laughs> teachers out there. Uh, I'm just using this as a general <laughs> A general point right because we do have lots of good teachers out there and we do have teachers that do the work that want to pick up that but I think if you look at the system as a whole I, I don't know I, I guess I need to be careful I'm not trying to say that if you don't do precision teaching you're lazy but there are you look at the reasons why you're not doing it and there there are lots of reasons well, I think I think you you weren't attacking, and you I believe that you were saying exactly that. Um, the question was, why isn't everyone using? It? You're giving solid reasons compared to what they're doing. It's now something different, and that chart comes into play. And you're talking about teachers. I'll give you a quick example, just from ABA presentation that I was doing. Uh -huh. I presented standard acceleration data. Somebody raised their hand. They Actually, they raised their hand. They came up to me and, and said, wow, your methods are really great. Your procedures are great. I just, you know, you could have done without the standard acceleration chart. You could have done without putting it on there. And, and after that's, you said that, so, after that person said that, did we hear this? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I was, we're, we're not I think, the, no, we're, we're, we're nonviolent town. But um, the point I'm, the point you are making, it's something different. But as much as learning something new, it in learning something new, you begin to see things that you don't see using other methods mm -hmm. and other graphing procedures. And that may challenge a lot of what people do. So they not only are doing something different, it challenges the way they think, the way they look at things, and what they expect. Yeah, that's a really good point. The, I guess if you think about behavior analysts, we can't even convince them to use the chart. So a teacher that isn't necessarily skilled or instructed in how important graphical display is, behavior, all the things that we know, if we can't convince this group and then you take this other group that might be removed from some of that, that that's, uh, that's an interesting point. And you're right. How many things would, uh, if you use the chart, I guess, for from the, that, that's a question from the BA. Yeah, I guess when I'm thinking about this question, it's not just education. This is just like, why isn't everyone using it? So that could be the behavior analysis community. Why aren't more behavior analysts using this? Is it going to turn something over that people might believe? Is it going to, uh, who knows, uh, make, maybe show people that some things that they thought were working weren't working? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's 
you talk about looking at both sides and that was sort of behavior analysts, maybe practitioners, maybe researchers asking me that question there or making that statement in a presentation, whereas in a recent article, I received feedback with regards to performance standards, which are part of precision teaching. Mm -hmm. And the educators don't like the rates that that to, that we we talk that we're going to talk about today in the article, but uh, we, they didn't like the rates because that challenges or it seems excessive. But then, if you don't use both, which is again learning something new, you're not going to see why you do that. Mm. So, yeah, that is another very good point. There are. This is a good question. And we could probably devote the whole podcast to discussing this because it's a multi, there's multifaceted reasons why more people don't use precision teaching. But I think some of the good news, to end this question on the good news, is more people are becoming interested in precision teaching and using a standard acceleration chart. You get some of this from... Let's say let's take no child left behind. That you know, while not a perfect law, one of the at least for precision teachers, one of the side effects, or I should say, one of the benefits has been the emphasis on accountability, and the emphasis on having change and documenting changes. And I think more people are saying, okay, what can we do that works out there? And guess what? Precision teaching works, and if people want behavior change, and if they are under the gun to produce that behavior change, then what are they going to look for? They're going to look for things like precision teaching. Yes. Well, I personally want to thank Karen for the question, and I hope uh, others listening out there provide us with other questions, because that was a lot of fun to address a question, I must say. So, mm. Well stated. Okay, let's go on to our article. Our article is written by Ogden Lindsley, and it's called, Is Fluency Free Operant Response Response Chaining? And yes, that is a question. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a good article. Ogden Lindsley, he wrote a number of, well... Excellent pieces, I guess we could say. And mm -hmm. talking about fluency, this was it was a pretty big paper. And he covers a number of interesting points here. I suppose the first thing that he starts talking about, which I thought was good, is setting the, the floor for why is fluency important? Why should people even care about it? One thing that I like that he talks about, and I actually have this highlighted, he says, the effects define fluency in the same way that the effects define reinforcement. And that's a good point because when you talk about fluency, and depending on who you talk to about fluency, people are going to have different definitions. I once wrote an article, and I made the comment, this, I wrote this article, this was a while ago, and I wrote something like in my article, Precision teachers discovered fluency, and, and this this reviewer was kind of joking. This was the time when Al Gore was uh, running a presidency with uh, George Bush, and this person said, uh, "What are precision teachers like Al Gore, where they discovered the internet?" <laughs> kind of clever. Yes, precision teachers did not did not discover fluency, but they certainly have functionally defined it, and they've done something to this concept that other people really, you know, when you look at how is it defined and how do people use it, some people look at it very differently than we do. The fluency, there are some other things that I thought were kind of interesting in this article where he talks about responses per minute and he actually puts behavior frequencies and that's, being a scientist, this is what's so appealing to me about precision teaching and especially about what we've learned about fluency. When you put behavior in frequency, now it's this, this continuum, it's this spectrum of human behavior frequencies. And if you look at 
behavior frequencies on that spectrum, there's so much you can discover and so many fascinating things you learn about behavior. And that's uh, some of the things that Lindsay was talking about. For example, he talks about television commercials and he talks about some of the scene changes at 100 per minute with lots of images. I mean, that was really, you know, he talks about this rapid stimulus bombardment. And I thought, that's really interesting because I never really thought about that. Well, we definitely have a, many of our kids are very adept and fluent at watching TV at this point because of how well <laughs> TV does what it does. So that's, that hits home. And now with my two and a half year old who watches different things and seeing all these different frequencies that he mentions and mm -hmm. even it goes so far as to say when you have a split screen and you have four different things going on at once, that that's 400 scenes per minute. Yeah. Just boggling, boggling. You know, uh, one thing that's also popular now in our culture is gaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was reading a post about StarCraft. And... For those people who don't know about StarCraft, StarCraft is a game that's by Blizzard, and it's a, what is it called, an RPG? Is that uh, real, a, a real time simulator, RTS or something. Yeah, but so that's the genre, I suppose, that it would be classified in. But in Korea, StarCraft is huge. They actually have a television show that's devoted to people playing StarCraft, and they have these announcers, and these announcers uh, will, like a Monday Night Football game, they're, they're highlighting the strategies, and they're talking about what's going on. But this article was talking about that people who are really adept at playing this game can do up to like four actions per second. And <laughs> if you think about four actions per second and you're playing in a minute, you know, that's what, 60 times? That's like 200 and, you know, 100 to 240. Can you imagine all of that? I mean, that's intense. Yep. But people who game, and when you look at people who are really good and you put behavior on a frequency, those things jump out at you. So you could look at someone who's really good that is in maybe the 150 to 200. I mean, those are the elite players. And then maybe mm -hmm. have a player like me who likes to play but's not very good. Maybe I'm around the 50 to 75. And, you know, if I play with someone who can do like 100 actions, I'm probably going to lose. Right. Just because I Definitely. can't, I, I just can't compete with that level of engagement. He would be at what Lindsley talks about is championship levels. Yes. <laughs> yeah, championship levels. And I think that's also important to note when you talk about fluency. It, and I guess we, we can jump around a little bit in the article, but towards the end of the article, he talks about how fluency is a behavior that endures for very long periods of time. And what Lindsley's doing in this article is not just talking about the effects of fluency while he does do that he talks about behaviorally how would we define this and he talks about it being response response chaining and he talks mm -hmm. about his uh, what was it his mule yeah the... it was he, he practicing with the mule uh, daily uh, he had the mule be, uh, was able to do um, was able to run after a basketball, carry to a basket, toss it in, stand in a box, ring a school bell, stamp his foot to the correct number of times to answer arithmetic questions, simple arithmetic, open a mailbox, put the wooden letter, carry a puck, pick in his mouth in parades, circle on command in front of the judges, pick up, drop. I mean, it's just behavior after behavior, but they practiced it daily. Yeah, and one thing that he says is that became a little too difficult for he and his wife to do because, as he says, where they were living, uh, Jack, which is the name of his, um, I guess his donkey. Trained our stallion Jack donkey, the silver butt Jack. Okay. I so I, I think its name was this silver butt Jack. Or was it just Jack? Mm. Well, you probably... <laughs> Regardless, 
or argued about the name of a donkey, but the the point that you were making is the important one. Yeah. So the uh, what's okay. So getting back to my thought, he uh, they had to to move, and so it was difficult to to keep doing what you know their daily practice. And the question was, did did he really need to do all of that? And what he said was even. Uh, after they stopped practice, months and years later, he could still do those behaviors. And they just stayed for very long periods of time. And, of course, he also talks about this with human perform performance. And what's interesting is, although you establish that at a certain level, and you may be really good at a certain level, if you don't practice... You may still be able to do that behavior, but it certainly won't be as crisp and necessarily as accurate and as focused as it once was when you were at the peak of that performance. It's like playing pool back in, <laughs> in high school or college, right? You probably did a lot of that. Well, I was going to use the example of playing soccer. I played for many, many years. There was a long lag between last time. Oh, yeah, I can kick a soccer ball, but not the same distance, not the same height, not with the same aim. But there's still certain things that I can do, and I may always be able to do that. But there definitely – there's a decrease in performance, but I still can perform at higher levels than I would if I wouldn't have done what I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. That's When you actually start looking at elite performers, they maintain – their level of performance for as long as they can. And really what gets a lot of the performers, depending on what type of sport they're in, is just when they start getting older, physically, things you know take a toll on them. I mean, it depends on what the sport is. If it's a game like football, obviously your body can't take that beating indefinitely. Right. But other other things like baseball, you know, you could probably have a longer longevity there. Golf, you can see people golf for long periods of time. Yeah, I guess it just really depends on the, what the sport is. Or or even the skill. Mm -hmm. For example, riding a bike. Some people ride it their whole life. Some people, you, you, you know, the old saying, you never forget how to ride a bike. Or it's easiest, you know, to remember is riding a bike. I forget the saying. <laughs> I brought it up and I forgot saying, but I could probably get up on a bike and ride it to almost maybe not as far and as fast, but I could ride it probably the same way that I could because when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. you know, what'd you do? You rode bikes. So you run around and you're riding them nonstop. So, mm -hmm. well, I'd yeah. like to talk about all the products or, or at least touch on some of these that uh, may not um, come quickly to people that he fleshes out. But, um, Perhaps we can start talking about some of the other products uh, of Fluency also. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, my uh, my favorite one in, in reading this was the under understanding. He, he said that one of them, one of the products of Fluency was understanding. And he used the example of uh, SAF meds and for those say all fast minute every day shuffled right mm -hmm. okay yes. and basically he used these in class in 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 his uh, um, college classes and never didn't teach what was the information was on so the students would learn with rote memorization the staff meds what was on one side compared to a definition or some other thing on the other side. So it was a picture or, or however he set them up. But he talks about how the students would talk to each other. They would do some learning. They would learn as they would fit it in. But I just thought that was very interesting because they were so fluent just with the SAF meds that they built their understanding past the SAF meds, and he didn't have to actually spend time instructing them instructing everything I, I thought that was just very telling mm -hmm. and they took they took their own understanding from that information and just in, in thinking about you know reading fluency and sometimes sometimes kids that I've worked with will take it past just what they're they're reading and so I, I just thought that was an interesting product uh, that he fleshed out here 
Yeah, I, I, that that's interesting. Again, if you think about you're putting behavior in a frequency and you're saying what happens when we observe behaviors at these particular frequencies and what he points out is with the SAF meds when they're around 30 he he says okay these seems these students sort of have this plateauing effect and if you can get beyond that that's when you really start to understand when you when you start developing this fluency and if you have these let's say a, a mnemonic or some type of strategy that you're using once you get by there that behavior is different at these higher frequencies uh -huh. and that is you know, I, don't, I think all of these products it would be good that some of these we look at we look at these clinically well, let's uh, let's talk about a few more things here. Let me see. We did talk about championship. I just, um, I mean, we talked about championship levels, but this quote I had it underlined, and I just, I just, it's exactly what I need to tell people and in, in to my students. But this statement, he urged the teachers to practice their learners far above normal frequencies to championship levels because this would develop the learner's confidence. And he, and I know that you just got done saying that, you know, we don't know that it does. But if you're thinking about a room of kids who, especially learners with disabilities, they can't read or they can't perform math as fast as their, their peers. Being able to do something like that and being able to do it fluently and, and showing endurance and stability and, and um, retention can make that, as he goes on, and very reinforcing. And so, and, you know, building that skill is going to continue with that skill. So I, I just thought that statement where he urged teachers to keep going and going, and especially going back to the original question we had with regards to the the higher performance standards, such as 200 words per minute for oral reading. Why so fast? Well, this is why. Yeah. No, that's an, uh, an excellent point. The... Uh... When, when I read this article, there's so much ground that's covered, it's hard to say, okay, what's what's the one thing that jumps out? Because like four things jump out mm -hmm. at me. Uh, one of the things, the other things that I, I think that Lindsay does here is he talks about the mechanism, you know, what is going on behaviorally? Why is this happening? And he talks about, and this is his question, and it comes from the article, and he ends this too, that fluency is it response response chaining or this linking that occurs between one response to the next response and it's it's you know he lays out the case for why that may be that fluency could be this response response these response response linkages mm -hmm. and it's um well, that's very interesting thinking about it that way. Any other uh, comments about this article, Doug? I would recommend reading it. <laughs> it's on the website if you're interested. If you subscribe through iTunes, you can't see this, but it will be on my website. And it is. It is. It's a very good article. And fluency is something that I think precision teachers should be very proud of fluency is very practical it's something that you know again it's not the only thing that precision teachers do but it is something that has application for students for all types of behavior and you know Lindsley you could tell from this article that he was very pleased at the discovery precision teachers made with fluency and it uh he, he also talks at the end that, hey, you don't have to be in the laboratory to make a discovery. Sometimes you know, in the natural sciences, this happens too, that these discoveries can happen in the field. And certainly with what precision teachers have done through having the chart, through measuring behavior, 
uh, with frequency and saying, okay, what's happening? The, these discoveries were made and you know, no one else has it. Precision teachers have it and there's a big literature to support uh, the use of fluency. So this is a very good article and a lot of good technical points that are brought up by Lindsley here. I want to go a step further. I want to say, okay. I want to I want to actually I'm I'm holding the um issue of the behavior analyst and this entire issue volume 19 number 2 fall 1996 was the first issue I ever got when I joined the ABA. Uh, uh, you get this when you join ABA. It is it has quite a few articles on fluency by mm -hmm. um there's just some wonderful articles in here, and if you ever got your hands on this, it would be well worth keeping. So, Are your hands tingling right now? Um, a little bit, but I'm not sure if it's not from the original music we started with or if that I'm holding this. So I'm still... Or it could be that you're just talking to me. That <laughs> There could be three things going on, so we'll try to parcel it out here as we go. or as yeah, we... We'll, leave, we'll leave it at that. Okay. And now... Let's go to the interview with Ogden's wife, Nancy Hughes Lindsley. I would like to welcome Nancy Hughes Lindsley to the podcast. Welcome, Nancy. Hi. Hi, Rick. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I um, always like to start off the podcast by whenever I speak to my guests and just ask, you know, how did you become involved in precision teaching? I learned about precision teaching only after I met Ogden. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was through Ogden, and I would probably should say at this point that I have always considered myself to be um, on the fringes of, of the PT community, um, wanting to support Ogden and other people in it rather than being a um, great practitioner of <laughs> precision teaching. So it was it was after meeting him that I began to he taught me about the chart and taught me how to chart and um and I have used the chart some in various kinds of ways over the years. Yeah, I suppose I should have clarified for some listeners who might not know that uh your special relationship with Og, you two were married for yes. how many years? Well, we were together thirty two and a half years and we were wow. technically married. Was twenty nine of those years, so we had a uh, somewhat of a commuting relationship for the first few years because I was still in graduate school and then had a um, a, a scholarship to work off. You know, in the I had to spend a couple of years working for the agency that had sponsored me and sent me to graduate school. So uh, we had a every weekend commuting relationship and holidays. Which actually worked quite well for both of us at that, you know, those first couple of years. Mm -hmm. How did you meet Og, if you don't mind me asking? I met him uh, at a conference. I, I, I met him at a conference in Denver, which um, was put on. It was called the first annual behavior modification conference, which always made me laugh. <laughs> and it was put on it was put on by the Jefferson County Department of Social Services, which is a, a suburb Jefferson County is the county just to the west of Denver County, up, up close to the foothills and um, it 's actually where i 'm from and I had uh, been living abroad for a couple of years and came back and had a uh, job at the social service department and I was an undergraduate, this is kind of a long-winded statement, but um, I had been an undergraduate fine arts major, and when I took this job, it was with, um, you could in those days you could take a, a civil service exam in the state of Colorado, probably in most states, and if you scored well enough, then you would be able to be hired in state agencies. And I had heard about casework when I came back from living abroad from a friend of mine, and it seemed to meet sort of the topography anyway of what I thought would be a better career for me than what I'd been doing, which was um, architectural drafting and, um, you know, sort of more artsy oriented things and, um, but, but too isolated. I knew I needed something more social at that point in my life anyway. And, um, so I interviewed for, um, positions in, uh, well, actually I, I only interviewed in one, uh, place, which was the Jefferson County Department of Social Services and got the job. 
and um, was feeling a little bit like, gosh, I haven't gone very far from home <laughs> except for living abroad. But at any rate, one of the, my jobs was um, I was the liaison to the um, uh, mental health center because I was working in child welfare and we had a lot of clients whose families were involved in the mental health system, of course. And um, at one of those meetings, I uh, one of the men that was working in the uh, Jefferson County Mental Health Department um, said, oh, you should come to a conference. And keep in mind that I was a complete naif to all of, all of this stuff. I, was, I think I was in my first year of working in social services. I, was, uh, I had just begun um, graduate school. I'd been there maybe a couple of months. And... Um, and anyway, he showed me a, a roster of the people who were going to be presenting, and I just remember that as he went down the list of people in this roster, he said, oh, and Crazy Og, you'll have to meet Crazy Og. And it, that just kind of made an impression on me, but I had no idea uh, about any of the presenters or really not much idea about, about behavior modification at all. So um, I managed to get to the last presentation of the last day of that conference and um uh, that's where i met him and just he was not presenting that day uh, he was just also in the audience it's, i'm interested i'm interested about that phrase crazy og how did he get that was that just because he would shock people with his presentations i think it was a constellation of behavior he was so energetic and so fluent in his um, knowledge base and so funny and often so outrageous that I think it was just all of those things put together in addition to doing things that were pretty unusual for a lot of people. And one of the things that comes to mind is the the um, experiment or the demonstration that he made in one of Skinner's classes at Harvard when he was a teaching assistant where he dyed the pigeons one red and one green and brought them in to make the demonstration and um, other people have told me he made a point about I don't know great ideas by sticking a light bulb in his mouth and it would go you know it would light up <laughs> so he was I mean he was quite theatrical in um, in the best ways he was a great entertainer and I just think all of that. And he also really enjoyed people. And so um, when he was around people, he liked to entertain them and, and learn about them. And, uh, and I just think all of that just made him a really uh, unusual person. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time, well, I didn't actually speak to him, but the first time I ever heard him, when I was a graduate student at Ohio State, we would have once a year a teleconference seminar where we would interview you know, the great people in our field. And Ogden was a, a few years ago one of the participants, and I was listening to him speak. And you know, people would ask him questions, and he would just give answers that were really well done. But I don't think that people were prepared for for what he what he, what he was saying. <laughs> I mean, it was really uh, very interesting. For example. He would say, uh, oh, what, what did he say that really shocked me? He was talking about schooling, and he drew the analogy that when people all use the same measure, that that's just like prison. And he said, we should put all the kids in prisoner outfits. And it was, <laughs> it was a great, vivid analogy, but he was absolutely right. Mm. Yes, now, I, mm -hmm, that's very like Ogden. Um, he had uh, another thing that he had a great way with words and a great way with image. And I, I must have heard him speak, I don't know, a thousand times and many times about the same topics and issues. And I never, ever, ever was bored listening to him. I mean, everything, every time he made a presentation, there was always something really creatively different about what he had to say. You know, all of his new thinking would come in to a, an, a presentation, things that he'd learned over the over the last time I'd heard him talk about something, things that he'd pick up from the audience were all thrown in. He was a very, very creative guy. And an, another thing that I think uh, 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 kind of made him susceptible to be calling uh, Crazy Og was um, 
he's such a gentleman. I mean, he was raised as a gentleman and he was dignified looking and he dressed well and he spoke well. And um, at the same time, he would say something completely outrageous that looked like it would not have come out of his mouth. <laughs> and I, I think that was often really stunning and surprising to people. So dressing kids up in prison garb would be really typical. Now, when you you were a graduate student, what were you what were you majoring in? Social work. That was uh huh. The I was at the DU, the University of Denver School of Social uh, Social Welfare. It was called. So you nope, graduated. You... Sorry, it was called. I'm sorry, it was called <laughs> the University of Denver School of Social Work. Uh, okay. When I came to Kansas, they, they were called the School of Social Welfare, and I had just begun in that program, so I was learning all the things that you learn in the early days of, of social work education, which really have more to do with uh, policy issues, social policy issues, and how those are established. And So I, I had not even come to the kind of coursework that had much to do with behavioral intervention. So you, you graduated and you took a job in your field? Yes, actually, I um, as I said, I had to. I had a state of Colorado um, scholarship <clears throat> from the social service department, and um, when I finished the degree, then I went back to the agency that had sent me back to Jefferson County, and worked a commensurate number of months that I'd been in, in graduate school. It was a terrific program. Um, it paid for my. Um, master's degree in social work, and I have never, ever regretted getting that degree. So you worked in the field after that? Yes, uh -huh, I'm sorry, yes. I went back and worked two years um, at Jefferson County in child welfare again in foster care, and I uh, then came, I waited, Ogden and I decided that I would wait until I um, had a, a job that I would enjoy in Kansas, and I was hired at this uh, School of Social Welfare at KU on a child welfare grant, and that's when I moved here. So that was the summer of, that was August of 1975. And what, what would you do with your job? I'm curious, did you have a caseload where you would manage children? Yes. Um, <clears throat> at the time that I started in social work in Colorado, the um, the caseloads were called mixed caseloads. So it meant that you would have, at least in the child welfare, well, I started out doing basic interviewing for people who were coming in for services. And that was um, just such an incredibly eye-opening experience because... Um, I didn't really know much about the welfare system, either people who were receiving benefits or people who were in the system because of problems with their kids or if they were on old age pension. I just, I just didn't know. And um, it's a great way for anybody who's going into social services to begin because, uh, for example, I would interview people uh, who were uh, well. Here's a here's an here's an example. I interviewed a man uh, maybe the third day on the job, um, who was oh probably 68 at that point, something like that, 70 maybe, who had worked uh, at a blue collar job his entire life, who owned his home, who raised his children, who saved his money, and his wife had cancer and died and wiped out absolutely everything that they had. Um, he was about to lose his home, he had no income, he had no retirement left, and it was just a really stunning uh, introduction to me for what happens to people even when you play your life absolutely by the rules that society sets and then society isn't there to help you when you fall through the crack. Wow. So that was, and I was, I did that sort of basic interviewing for, I don't know, a couple of months. And um, and then I realized that where the real action in the department was, was in child welfare. And I went to the director of that particular part of the agency and said, I'd like to, I'd like to work in this, this part of the agency. And um, at those, at that time, there were what were called mixed caseloads, which meant that in child welfare, I had... Some kids who were on probation, uh, some kids who were orphaned and in the foster care system or in institutions, some kids who were um, abused and neglected and um, placed in foster care. We would go out and do the abuse and neglect reports. We would go, or when, when we had a report come in, we would go out and investigate the, uh, the complaint. 
Um, we had relationships with other agencies in the county and um, would place kids. I had kids that I would, you know, find a placement for in either a foster care situation or an institution and transport the kids back and forth. And um, if the foster parent was having a difficult time, I'd, I'd be asked out to give my two cents, which, you know, was, <laughs> what did I know? <laughs> I was a fine arts major. <laughs> That's why I finally went to the uh, head of the of the department and said, gosh, you know, I really like this work, but I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. I have no base in this. I don't have children. You know, I, I, I had one brother. I never liked to babysit. I just, you know, I, I, I need some education. So I applied for the, 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 uh, the grant scholarship, whatever you want to call it, and um, was sent to graduate school. And so I did, uh, I, I did that work. I guess I was there a year about the time that I met Ogden and then worked on the vacations, you know, uh, during graduate school, then worked the two years after graduate school. And then when I came to KU, um, I was teaching on this child welfare grant and had a lot of contact with um, the state foster care system and the state child welfare system. And um, so, and I had a private practice off and on for years and I, I always kept um, always kept some direct service activity in my in my um, in my life. How long did you stay in the field? Um, I retired when Ogden died. Oh so wow! I, you were working that whole time. I yeah. didn't realize that. Yes, I um, I was in the School of Social Welfare for. I think it was six years, and the grants began to um, dry up. That was let's see. Um, to an 81, I believe, I applied for and got a job um, across the street from the School of Social Welfare at KU and moved into the psych department, in the clinical, into the clinical psych program. And I was there from, uh, I think that was 81, <clears throat> and I was there until, actually technically I was there until March of 2007, because when we found out that Ogden was really ill, I went in and said that I needed to retire immediately and um, my boss at the time said finally he said why don't you just kind of take all your sick leave and all your vacation and just see where you're going with this illness and and retire later which was one of the kindest things anybody has ever recommended to me he was he was a really lovely guy who was 28 days older than I and who died a year after Ogden. It was just really a stunning set of losses there. But um, so I technically, I hardly was at the office from September uh, until March of 2005 when I retired. And since then, I've been um, working with Ogden's Archive and uh, with Behavior Research Company, so I feel like I actually never did retire. <laughs> I'm going to ask you some questions about that soon, but I have another question, and this is something that I always am interested to ask people who, like yourself, when you did your work, you didn't necessarily go to school and uh, study precision teaching, but there's someone in your life that does it. For example, myself, I work, I've used, I've taught my kids to chart, we've done all kinds of things. But I, I never really did anything with my wife. So, what was that like? Would would Og talk with you about certain interventions, or did it come up naturally, or just was that part of your life like separated, and you would listen to him and so on? But... Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I certainly my. Hmm. My introduction to Ogden was completely social. It was not anything to do with professional, except mm -hmm. that it was a professional environment where we met. And um, <laughs> I don't know, we started going back and forth between Denver and Kansas City. And at one point, fairly early in the relationship, because we were never with professional people, it was just the two of us doing things, going to move, whatever we did. And um, at one point, we were in an airport, and I don't know, it, it was several times this happened that people would come up and talk to him and be sort of, you know, uh, impressed by him. And, I, and finally, I said to him, who are you anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think he always really liked that, that my... Um, 
attraction to him and his to me it had really nothing to do with professional mm-hmm. uh, with professional stuff. It was really very personal. And um, but uh, you know, obviously, when you're around someone a lot, you you know what's happening with them, and, and they talk. He talk. He would talk to me. Sure, he would, and I would talk to him. And uh, things would come up in our life about, you know, animal training or what to do about a situation. And, you know, clearly he would apply principles that I learned from him in those situations. And so he taught me things. And I Mm -hmm. like to think that maybe I taught him things now and then as well. I I, I do think that. Um, I know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, So I would say that I was never his pupil. Um, I did not ever make a concerted effort to become part of the PT community and to use PT or to be a teacher or Mm -hmm. um, because I really felt like it was his thing. You know, it was his world, his field. And it looked to me like, um, you know, maybe the, the better part of valor here was to have a relationship that didn't try to entwine myself too much. And he was the same with my professional life. He was very supportive um, if I needed to have him go with me to an event or something, he he would do that, and I would do that for him. Um, and I certainly feel close to people in the um, PT community. I've always felt welcome and a part of things, but I've never ever thought of myself as a real practitioner or mm-hmm. somebody with much to offer in the technical field. Or um, and really, in, 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 it's not that I don't think I'm trainable, but I really it was partly by design. I, I I thought it was better to have our personal life between us and uh, to support each other in what we did, and he agreed. Mm-hmm. Did he ever talk to you about what precision teaching social work would be like? Oh, yeah. And in fact, when I first met him, he had um, uh, a student named Judy Green, Judy Cop Green. And one of the first things that I remember him talking about professionally to me was that um, he envisioned the world of the chart as not just uh, not just precision teaching but he he saw the chart spreading to precision medicine precision social work precision uh, I don't know carpentry you know Mm -hmm. he, he thought it could be used very broadly and um, and Judy Cop Green had just published an article in this uh, journal of uh, which uh, one of the social work journals I've forgotten just at the moment which one that was about precision social work, and uh, there have been a few social workers here and there, uh, and I made actually several presentations about charting about how it could be used in social work um, to classes of my of mine to um, agencies that I interacted with. And came up with kind of the same sort of um, barriers and walls that other people have experienced in trying to spread PT. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, precision social work, I don't think ever really caught on, although it's certainly a field that um, could have a lot of application for for charting. Mm -hmm. One of the things that where I've gone off in my career, I'm so interested in just graphing and the culture of uh, the visual cu- culture that all types of data graphics can provide, and certainly the the standard acceleration chart that is very specific to and works very well with time series data. And so much of what we look at professionally are how does behavior, whatever that behavior event is, change across time. And I've always been fascinated in thinking about how what we do would be could have such an impact to so many other people so that doesn't surprise me that uh, you two had those conversations and well and uh, and also there were you know people around a lot I did go to some conferences and um, events with Ogden over the years that um, uh, you know, as I say, I always felt welcome at, and so I, I overheard a lot, and I absorbed a lot. I, I, maybe that's it. I, I, I absorbed by osmosis a lot, uh, much more than I ever really made a concerted effort to um, to, to learn in a formal sort of way. Um, and that, you know, I think it worked very well for us. Um, I think other people are able to have a 
a different kind of working relationship with one another. But, um, you know, I was also not Ogden's first wife. And I, you know, sort of assessed the terrain and thought, hmm, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how these other relationships have worked. But I guess <laughs> I guess I'll do this, uh, you know, the way it seems to be working for us. Um, so, I, I, but I, I don't want to make it sound as if I w ever felt um, like I was opposed to any of these techniques or that the chart, that I don't see the power, I do see the power of the chart. Um, I do see the power of the graphics as a as an old art major. <laughs> you know, I see the power of the graphics. Um and I do find the interventions of behavior modification and behavior analysis and the way the chart can be used, I see those as very, very useful. And, you know, I, I, it, it's part of why I feel a commitment to Behavior Research Company now of trying to uh, keep the things that Ogden was able to offer people alive in his death. Mm -hmm. When One thing that people may not know about is or may not know a lot about is the behavior research company because when you think about a company you think okay corporation or huh. you have some image of it can you yes. describe the behavior research company yes and I'll, I'll describe the the physical plant to you also and maybe that'll be um, instructive um, Ogden be started Behavior Research Company in uh, Boston. Actually, in his behavior lab, behavior research lab was in Waltham at the um, oh gosh, the mental health center there. I'm sorry, the institution. I'll think mm -hmm. of that just now. And um, I, the first post office box he opened was, I believe, at the end of October 1959 in Belmont, um, which was a suburb probably pretty close to Met State Hospital where, where his lab was. And he, as I kind of pieced together finally, he started be Behavior Research Company, or I, I refer to it always as BR Co., so did he. Um, he started BR Co. to market the laboratory um, uh, equipment that he had designed, like the plunger, the Lindsley manipulandum, um, and a few other things that he designed and had made. Um, and uh, I think he saw that two ways. I'm, first, he was a real innovator with um, his lab, obviously. That was the first human behavior lab. So nobody else had those sorts of materials or um, pieces of equipment available. And I think he saw uh, that other people would probably like to replicate his lab, and he wanted to have this equipment available to them. Ogden was never very driven by money, so I seriously doubt that uh, he liked to be compensated. But um, you know, he—I I don't think he ever saw BR Co. as a place where he was going to get rich. Mm -hmm. And he certainly did not. <laughs> from, um, I mean, Ogden always had a very healthy um, income from his work, but you know, uh, he he just was not driven to make millions of dollars. Um, so that was the initial starting of BR Co. And when he and I think he did sell quite a few um, manipulandum through that, and I, I'm not sure what else. He was doing charting in the lab of a very sort of a different sort than he's got now. But when you look back at the very, very early charts that were going on in, in his lab, you can see the very, very beginnings of the standard acceleration chart. Very rudimentary. <clears throat> um, and then when he moved to Kansas, he moved here to take the job as a full professor um, in what was then, I've never quite been clear about this. He was a research professor he was not in the School of Education. It was at the Med Center, KU Medical Center in Kansas City. And he was hired into pediatrics, I think. And there was also a children's rehabilitation unit. But I think that was, a, I'm not sure if that was in, in uh, Kansas City or not. <clears throat> but at any rate, I think it was just prior really to special ed becoming really a field. That would have been 60 he came, he was hired in 64, I think, or recruited in 64, and he arrived on campus in Kansas City in uh, January 65. And um, 
I think he probably didn't do much with Behavior Research Company in that first year or so that he was here. But as far as I can see, he bought a little building in 1966 where BRCO is today. And if you can envision um, Rainbow Boulevard Fair in uh, Kansas City, Kansas, very close to State Line Road, which is the, the demarcation in this part of the city between Kansas and Missouri. So the University of Kansas Medical Center actually starts on Rainbow Boulevard and goes um, east about four blocks, maybe three blocks, to State Line. So it's just right on the Missouri line. And uh, Ogden and his then wife Janet moved, and her children moved um, into a house that was probably about 10 blocks south of the Med Center along Rainbow Boulevard in a really nice little area called Westwood Hills. And then somewhere along the line in that first year, he bought an old gas station that sits right on Rainbow Boulevard. It's a white cinder block building, and um, it had been a functioning gas station up until the point he bought it. So he closed the bays and uh, bricked in the doors and put glass brick to let in light in the only places where there were probably originally um, uh, plate glass in, in the old in the, when it was a gas station and he moved into that with the um, all of really all of his stuff from the lab he had all of his client records from the lab all of his experimental records all of which are still there at the moment and um, his graduate students then were Carl Koenig and Ann Del Duncan and um, who am I leaving out? Uh, oh, many. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm leaving out several. But um, Carl in particular was very much a part of BR Co. And I think the others were too. But in my mind, I always think of Carl as being really the primary graduate student that, had, that worked with BR Co. Ogden had a secretary at KU Med, uh, Sandy... Her name is now Sandy Luck. Um, I can't remember what her name was then, but Sandy uh, told me not long ago that she would work all day in the office at KU uh, Med Center for him, and then in the late afternoon she would come over and work at BR Co., which is about, I don't know, three blocks, four blocks. It was right in between KU Med and the house. And uh, she would come here and work in the afternoon, and then sometimes on the weekends as well she would come in and work. So um, that's BR Co., and it, it's affectionately known to me as the bunker. Uh, Ogden never really liked that term, but it is kind of a bunker. Uh, Jack Allman, Steve Graff's uh, brother-in-law, lived in the bunker for a couple of months one summer, which Ogden always thought, gosh, it's such a great you know, intellectual scientific environment. You could live right there and have all of the computer and everything you need right there and so efficient. It's, <laughs> and, you know, most anybody else would look at that and think, oh, my God. <laughs> so um, now uh, all of the things that were in the bunker when... Um, well, let me, let me back up. Then Ogden moved from the Med Center over to the KU campus. And at that point, one of his graduate students, uh, a guy named Jim Johnson, took over pretty much the day-to-day -day operations at some point in there at BR Co. So he would come by in the evenings and um, pick up the mail, and he would send out orders and um, you know, send, make deposits of checks, things like that. And he had that function for, I think it was 19 years before he finally gave up. <laughs> And um, that was probably in, no, oh, I don't know, maybe 2000 where he, or maybe, actually maybe more like 1998 where he said, I, I've had it here. I don't know okay. if that all adds up to 19 years, but at any rate, um, and once Ogden moved over to the Lawrence campus, he, he didn't come over to BR Co. very much. It was it, not to the building because he really didn't need to. He could, he could do the work he needed to do for BR Co. from home. So he would leave KU in the evening, you know, late afternoon and come home. And frequently he'd spend, you know, a couple of nights a week or um, a part of the weekend working on the BR Co. books or um, thinking about new products to, to develop or talking with guys on the phone, people on the phone who had questions. Um, so he was very involved, but it began to be more of an off-site kind of arrangement than it had been originally. 
it's now pretty much a warehouse, and um, Scott Bourne is the person that uh, has really been such an incredible supporter and helper of PR Co. Um, since ever since Ogden died and um, Scott will come over a couple of times a week from or a couple of times a month I'm sorry from Lawrence to send out orders or occasionally I'll send one out if something comes in that um, that I'm here to do so really over time uh, as it started out with the laboratory equipment then when he came to KU and started to develop the standard acceleration chart or originally the standard behavior chart um, it, it really, BR Co. began to have more of a function of, of supporting the production and sale and distribution and um, marketing and uh, arranging events for the chart and about the chart. Uh, and the behavior bank, you know, was part of was part of part of BR Co. Um, Ogden had Precision Media attached that, you know, he had separate bank accounts for all these things, and none of them was ever made into a real corporation. Um, <clears throat> so some of those some of those functions, most of those functions go on today. Nobody's asked us for a Lindsay Manipulandum <laughs> in my tenure here, but um, you know we still have all the charts. Um, Steve Graff and Jack Almond have developed through Zero Brothers, which was um, the the Zero Brothers were originally Steve um, uh, Steve Graff, Jack Almond, and Ogden, and they called themselves Zeke, Zach, and Zog the Zero Brothers, and they had a black hat with a black baseball cap with a, a white Z on it, and, uh, you know, that kind of iconoclastic stuff that all, all of them pull off very well and you know, really entertain the rest of us with and manage to get really incredible work done. So the Zero Brothers, uh, the surviving ones, Zeke and Zach, um, are still doing things for BR Co. They invented or developed the year chart and they it's just they've just done many many things uh including being part of, of Ogden's archive committee what would you what is the biggest seller uh at BR Co? um the uh the two there are two um the daily per minute chart and the timings chart mm -hmm. those are the things that we sell the most of um we also still sell a lot of um acceleration finders rate finders um, counters, timers, things like that. The full array of charts that are available are, are rarely purchased. And it's a bit of a problem as a, as a business. You know, how do you keep those kinds of things available to the public? Mm -hmm. And yet, um, if you don't sell enough of them, you can't really spend a lot of money. To, to print the charts is very expensive. And um, in order to get a decent rate for each chart you have to have a lot printed so if someone wants a uh, weekly per week chart for example which we had you know for which we have just reprinted um, with lots of promises oh yeah we'll use lots of those <laughs> you know, well, not very many people have bought those and it's uh, mm -hmm. you know this was always aggravating to Ogden because it just uh, you know it, it occupied a lot of his um, Oh, what can I say? His uh, creative mind, dealing with things that are just really business issues, and he, well, he was pretty good at business. He didn't, he didn't like that kind of stuff very much. You know, how do you, how do you cost anal analyze these things and budget it? And he did it, but um, it was always kind of aggravating to him. He just liked people to learn the chart, use the chart, order the chart, and uh, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you mentioned the archive committee. Can you talk about what the archive committee is? Yes. When Ogden realized that he was not going to be leaving the hospital in this final illness, he um, started thinking about what to do about his professional papers. I, I should say he had actually started thinking about this a long time ago. When he retired from KU in 1990, he began to think about what, what to do with his papers eventually. And um, Parenthetically, he um, had several conversations with his good friend B. Barrett about her papers and what she was planning to do with them. And one of the things he really wanted to see happen was that since B. had more financial stability than he did, uh, he thought it would be a good 
combination to take her papers and his and establish an archive, a freestanding archive at BRCO in the building, in the bunker. And to take that he would provide the building and the maintenance and she would provide some money to uh, run the little archive that the two of them would have. And part of his thought was then other people could make contributions of their papers to to the archive. That was what he really wanted. He wanted be our, he wanted um, other precision teaching people to be able to put archival papers there. In the end, B uh, was never very interested in that proposition, and she left her papers and some money to North Texas, um, and I think uh, Jesus. Um, Rosales is the, the person who is pretty much in charge of, of her papers. Um, and then, so in the, so that's parenthetically. So he'd been thinking about it a long time. And I think he investigated KU as a repository, Harvard as a repository. Um, and he made an early contact, which I didn't realize for quite a long time. He made an early contact with the Archive of the History of American Psychology at the University of Akron. And the person that he spoke to at that time was John, um, oh gosh, uh, <laughs> not Cobblestone. Oh, I'm horrified. I can't think of his uh, last name properly. But the the two people who start the married couple who started that uh, archive um, had some pretty definite ideas about what they wanted included. And I it took me a long time to remember that he had had that early conversation. So let me leave at that for a moment and come back to now Ogden's in the hospital and realizes he's not going to survive this illness. And he started thinking about, okay, what could he do then with his papers? And um, <clears throat> he thought they need, they need to be cataloged because um, some points in Ogden's career, he was incredibly well organized and had notebooks of correspondence and notebooks of ideas and notebooks of just data, you know, just very well organized. And at other points, when he didn't have as much secretarial and administrative help, he was like the rest of us. He'd have a big pile of stuff on his desk and he'd put it in a box and move it over in the corner and write on top of the box, sort, you know, class notes, 1988. <laughs> and so uh, there were a lot of those boxes around. <laughs> so um, he knew that that there was a lot of really valuable stuff in his papers and a lot and a lot of stuff that would be important to other people historically and to the field and he knew that there was a lot of junk so um, he thought about who and, and he also had a lot of things that he wanted or several really important things that he wanted to be sure were published and he wanted those to be written I mean obviously he wasn't going to have time to do it and um, he wanted to think about who would be on his committee that would both help sort the paper and look for what was important and who would also take um, pertinent work and uh, write up the articles that he wanted to have written. And in the end, he thought about, and I know that this really, uh, it really occupied a lot of his thinking for a few days because he was, he was, not wanting to leave people out and not wanting to make a statement about, um, you know, whether he thought somebody was more important than somebody else in the, in the world of, um, you know, his, his colleagues uh, to ask them to be on a committee. Mm -hmm. But um, I think he really went through trying to figure out who would have something, who would have knowledge of a particular area or time, who would have maybe time to be involved, which of course, you know, that's really tough for anybody. Um, who would be able to take some of the work that he had begun and that they were working on and put it together and write an article. So in the end, he came up with 18 people. And um, those 18 people, he called every one of them and asked if they'd be willing. And every single one of them, I overheard every one of those conversations. And uh, every single person he called said, yes, of course. And um, right before, let's see, right before he became ill, maybe that spring, he had talked with Abigail Cocken, uh, who had been one of his graduate students at KU. She came from Oregon to be a graduate student for him. And um, 
he, he, Abigail had asked him, what are you going to do about your papers? And they had this little conversation. And finally she said, well, why don't I come and help you and we'll start sorting them and I'll come at Thanksgiving. Well, by Thanksgiving he was dead. So, uh, but, but when he called her from the hospital and said, would you head the committee? And she agreed. It was a bit of a con- continuation of kind of the plan that they'd had for a while. And uh, we're, you know, and then it kind of evolved that I would own the papers as his spouse and his um, uh, executrix of his um, his estate and mm-hmm. the head of his, I'm um, the trustee of his trust. And um, uh, so Abigail and I, Abigail and I have always been very good friends and we knew each other here in Kansas when she lived here. Um, so um, that's how the committee was formed. And um, Abigail is a very conscientious person, very energetic, has done a lot of writing herself. And I would say she was is really the reason why the committee has been able to kind of coalesce and have a focus. And, um, you know, some people have contributed in coming to, to Kansas and actually sorting the papers. Some people have not, but they've left, you know, a lot of, lent a lot of uh, support in other ways. Um, so it's, that's, that's the committee. And uh, one of the sidebars here to this archive is that, um, I'll, I'll talk a minute, in a minute, well, let me, let me say this about the logistics of the committee. Uh, Ogden, the first time I came to Kansas, right next door to BR Co. is a great big house, uh, one of the old Kansas City stone manses that uh, it's like three and a half stories high and um, uh, Ogden had rented space in this building uh, and had graduate students and people working for BR Co. filtering in and out of here in the building next door and at the the point that I came to Kansas for the first time which was probably I don't know August of 72 something like that um, he was just moving everybody out of this off out of these off, out of these floors that he rented in the house and moving them back over to BR Co because he was you know clearly spending most of his time in, in uh, Lawrence so over the years as this house would become available uh, for, for sale Ogden would say oh I should buy that house I should I should definitely buy that house and finally in the hospital it happened to be for sale again and um, a guy was renovating it. So Ogden said to me, um, I want you to buy that house next to BR Co. And, you know, classic Ogden, we already had property in Montana. We had the house in uh, Hawaii that we were planning to retire to within about six months of the time that he was ill. We'd already bought the house. We had a whole setup there. Uh, and uh, and we had the ranch west of Lawrence. And, uh, you know, we had plenty of property <laughs> And I said, well, what do you want me to do with that house next door? And he said, I, I don't know, but I think it will figure into the archive in some way. So um, I bought the house on contract from the guy who had it for sale. And um, and at that point, my dad was ill, and I spent quite a lot of time in Colorado until my dad died a couple of, of years after Ogden did. And in June of 70, uh, I'm sorry, June of 2007, I moved back to Kansas City and moved back into this house while I'm renovating the ranch. Okay, so that said, then this gave me a place to bring all of the boxes of papers that were in the house, the, the ranch house, over here to Kansas City, put them in the basement, and to run this house as kind of a little hotel for people on the archive committee. So the people who have come have had to pay their own way, and most people have been very generous about contributing food and so forth. But um, it really has been, I think, a little intellectual hive of people coming and working in the archive and enjoying each other and talking and thinking and writing. I think it's just exactly what he envisioned it could be. Okay, now the other thing is Ogden wanted, uh, barring any other solution, he decided in the hospital that he wanted BR Co. to be his archive and that the building would be where the archive would go. It would be a private archive and and that that was to be my job to set up along with Abigail and the people on the committee. And I thought, well, okay, I'm the logistics person. So I started really doing a lot of um, research into what constitutes an archive and how do people use archives and what does it take to run one and 
I even went so far as to um, have some architect friend of ours draw up plans to divide BR Co. in half and have retail space on one side that I could rent in support of the building and um, put the archive in the other half. And uh, it would have been a very cool idea. But um, about six months down the line, I discovered that the little building that had been a garage had never been uh, zoned commercial. So Mm -hmm. it's it's... It's a bunker in a residential zoning. So um, the upshot of this is that that very clearly was, you know, kind of a waste of money to invest. I I just had no idea that, you know, if I had tried to convert it into a more overtly commercial space, um, it would have reser- I would have been in violation of the zone. They would have made me take out. You know, it just could have been a nightmare. So then I started thinking more seriously about, well, should it be here in the house? What else can I do? It could be at BR Co., but you know, how am I going to maintain the building? I'm not going to live forever. How's this going to endure? I called someone that, uh, Ab- that I knew that Abigail had referred me to, and um, he suggested either the APA archive or this archive of the history of American psychology. And then he said, well, really, it's not uh, the APA archive is not a good option because it's just about APA. But try this Akron archive. When I called the director of that archive and he called me back within a couple weeks um, because it was vacation, um, he was incredibly welcoming. It's David Baker is his name. And David Baker had recently come in to take over the uh, operation from John Popplestone. That was the name of the... Uh, and John Popplestone and his wife, who was not who used her maiden name, which I can't remember, um, they were the ones to start it. And David Baker now was the first director who was not at the founding. And David said we would love to have anything of our, of Ogden's. And um, he said, in fact, I have some correspondence between him and Popplestone. So all of a sudden, that popped into focus for me, and I think I'm pretty sure that I remember correctly that Ogden and Popplestone had had a conversation in about 1990 that Popplestone was interested only in the lab and the early work that Ogden had done and nothing in, to do with precision teaching or education or any of the later stuff and that infuriated Ogden. So um, I think they had a, you know, whatever kind of parting of the words might have been had at that point, and I <laughs> did not uh, even pursue that from that point on. But it was so clear that uh, David Baker was so welcoming of all of Ogden's stuff and admired his work and wanted to have it. And, and by that time, they had also found some other correspondence between Ogden and other people, you know, in the field early on, still back in, in uh, New England. So, um, you know, there were already things of Ogden's in the, in the archive of the, uh, the history of American psychology. It also turned out in one of those sort of serendipitous uh, moments that David Baker said to me, you know, one of our longest term archivists who worked in this archive from the very beginning has moved from Akron. She retired. She moved to be closer to her daughter in Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> and I thought, well, Wow. So he gave me her number and her mind number, and we got in contact right away. And Sharon um, Oxenhart, Oxenhart is her name. Sharon um, met me right away, and I took a box of materials to her house, and she said, here's how we do it. And she went right through about a half a box and showed me how you item analyze and how they do this at, at Akron. And then she said, we, my husband and I are going back to Akron, where we still have a home that we're trying to sell. And uh, why don't you come there while we're there, and I'll take you to the archive and introduce you to everybody. And that's what she did. So that was April of 2006, I believe. And as it happened, uh, Jack Allman and Steve Graff had been here uh, in Kansas City working in the archive, and they came uh, over to... Actually, I have to say they moved all of the boxes, almost all of the boxes, out of the ranch house and over here. So they they have done, besides intellectual labor, they have done you know physical labor in behalf of the archive. And um, they came, drove over from from Youngstown, and Sharon and I and Jack and Steve met with the uh, with the staff at the archive. So the plan is they taught us how to archive according pretty much to their specifications and we're organizing the whole um, collection and uh, various things that people need to do. The writing that Ogden wanted to do are being photocopied and distributed to the people who said that they would take those tasks on. 
And uh, we're getting almost to the end of that. And I believe that the archive will be pretty much done and ready to go to Akron by the end of, of uh, um, June this year, 2009. That's excellent. And it will be ready. Uh, one of our concerns as a committee was that if it went to the archive uncatalogued, that it would be hard for the people to, for the committee members who'd been asked to, to write, uh, to get into the materials and find anything. It would have been impossible. Um, and it would have probably been a couple of years at least, maybe more, for the um, archive to get around to having the the person power to, to do the archiving, unless we could contribute money to it, which I just didn't have enough money to make that uh, realistic. So uh, now when it goes to the archive, it will be available um, to the public pretty quickly. I'm certainly looking forward to that. I'll be taking a trip to, to Akron. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, it's a ter- it is a very professional, very well run organization now, and they they have been given a building. I believe it was Roadway contributed a large building in downtown Akron, down the street from where the archive currently is, and they're they're raising money uh, right now for the. Uh, for the archive, for the new building, the restoration, and they have, you know, a plan for if we only get this much money and a plan for this much money and a grand master plan, all of which dovetail together. And what, one of their hopes is that by the time the building is completed, um, there will be lots of room for displays of, um, not they're not just a paper archive, they, they will accept... Um, you know all sorts of artifacts and including some personal artifacts like one of the things that I'm planning to send is an oak chair that Ogden um, we had in our house all the years that we were married uh, which was one of the chairs from one of the experimental chambers at behavior research lab at um, at Walt at Metropolitan State Hospital so they will they will take things like that as well and I think they'll they'll lend themselves to really interesting um, displays in years to come. Well, we are coming to the end of our interview, and I always like to ask, is there anything I should have asked you or anything else you wanted to talk about which we didn't touch upon? Well, uh, <laughs> no, not that I can think of particularly. Um, I hope I have represented Ogden fairly as a fascinating person. Uh, he was a great marital partner. Um, uh, I'm happy to have a way to help kind of move things along to the next step uh, with BR Co. And... Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you for the opportunity, Rick. Well, thank you so much for for your gen- for being generous with your time and also just all of the work that you're doing is I think the contributions that you're setting up and listening to you talk many wise decisions were made and those contributions will endure and they'll also be able to be accessible and that legacy that Ogden has will just live on, and I think that's it's just, all the all the I know there's just so much that you do and that the committee does and other people that is not recognized. So, and not only do I thank you for your time tonight, but all of that, all of those hours that you put in behind the scenes. Thank you so much, Rick. Well, I would, again, thank you, and maybe in the future, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to have you on again, and we could talk about some other interesting things that maybe we probably didn't get time to talk about tonight. I'll, I'll be thinking about those. Sure, I'd love to do that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome, Rick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome back. That was our fabulous interview with Nancy, and it's always a pleasure speaking with her. 
Well, that brings us to the end of the podcast. Doug, do you have any closing comments for I, our v- listeners? I just hope that uh, we hear more questions and any suggestions, uh, anything. And um, we look forward to everything. We look forward to anything and everything. Well said. Okay, for Doug Kostowitz, this is Rick Cabina saying goodbye, and to all of our Hawaiian listeners, mahalo. (laughs) 